You know, small shifts can have grave consequences. Subtle, very, very slight. And yet over time, those small shifts can leave, they can lead to grave consequences. And, and, and we'll get into those moments and, and we won't know how we got there. And yet it won't be incidental. <laughs> we will get to those moments and we won't have wanted to be there or willed to be there. And yet we find ourselves in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a destination we never intended. And we ask ourselves this question, how did we get here? You know, you know, pilots understand this principle really well. Pilots have this principle called the one in 60 rule. And the one in 60 principle, the one in 60 rule says this, if the, the nose of the plane is off by just one degree, just one degree, then every 60 miles that the, that the plane travels, it is one mile off from the destination they were intending. Which means that if, if you're off by just one degree, then the further that you go in the journey, the more distant you become from the destination you, you, you thought you were going toward. And a small shift like that, my goodness, it, it can have grave consequences. As a matter of fact, on, on November 28th, 1979, there, there was this plane, it's a sightseeing plane going over the Antarctic, coming from New Zealand. And as they had begun the journey, they were just two degrees off, just two degrees, which led to them being 27 miles off from the course that they thought they were on. The pilot wasn't aware. The crew had no idea and the passengers were completely caught off guard when the entire plane crashed into the side of, a, of an active volcano, killing 257 people, all because of a two degree shift. Because small shifts can have grave consequences. And we can find ourselves subtly pulled off course, not even knowing how we got there, not intending to have ended at that place, and yet, there we are. And what do we do then? You know, actually, this is, this, is, this is the principle I talk about every single class, every semester that I teach at Ozark Christian College. I mean, I have what's called syllabus week, which, yeah, I know. First of all, you might be thinking syllabus week, that's a little overkill. I believe they can read. It's not like I think that they don't know how to read the syllabus, but I wanna make sure that we take time to all just get on the same page at the very beginning. And usually, whenever I, whenever I bring them their syllabus, I say, hey, listen, the first page really helps, in cure, it helps cure insomnia. That's really half of its purpose. Uh, but it's really when we get to the second page that things get riveting. Uh, because, you know, syllabus, can, they, they can get really exciting. Um, but, but it's when we get to policies and procedures. It, there are two major paragraphs right at the very top. One of them says cheating in bold letters, and the second paragraph says plagiarism. And the first sentence of each of those paragraphs summarizes my feeling on these topics. The first sentence of cheating says this, don't do it, exclamation <laughs> point. And then plagiarism's first sentence says, don't do this either, exclamation <laughs> point. And at the very beginning, I just wanna say, hey, like, don't do this, but, but the reason why I don't want them to do this it's not just because I think it's wrong. It's deeper than that. It's actually something more along the lines of the, the one in 60 principle. Because you see, every decision that we make, we become someone different. Like every single decision that you make, you are becoming someone new. The question is who you are becoming. It's not, are you transforming with that decision? It's who are you becoming when you make that choice? And let me just be as, as honest as I can be. Small shifts can lead to grave consequences. As a matter of fact, I can't help, but when I'm going through this moment in syllabus week, I can't help but reflect on some of my classmates when I went to Ozark, who over the last several years, I've heard reports of them leaving ministries some of them even leaving the faith. 
some of them having families ransacked by affairs, by porn addictions. And I know, I know they find themselves in that space and they ask themselves the question, how did I get here? But I can't help but remember conversations I had with those classmates on dorm floors or in classrooms where, where I remember them bragging about lying on their confessional statement for that particular memory work, or, or, or cheating on an assignment, or plagiarizing half of a paper with the previous student's paper themselves. And, and it made me think, huh, you might be at a destination that you don't know how you got there, but the answer is there were subtle shifts years earlier that just a couple of degrees off put you 27 miles east of the destination that you thought you were going toward. This happens all the time, where we find ourselves in a situation and we don't know how we got there. But the truth of the matter is this, small shifts have grave consequences. We cannot overlook this. You cannot deny it. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? Now, my, my, my topic for the sermon, some of you have already heard from the intro, and you're probably somewhat confused right now as I'm going, <laughs> and it'll probably just get worse as the sermon goes, if I'm being honest. We'll, we'll get around to it, tying it all together, but the, the topic for the sermon is, in a world that says we have the power to change ourselves, we believe that the Holy Spirit still empowers. That, that's the topic I was given. And I think it's a worthy approach and something that's important for us to wrestle with because basically what it's asking is, how do you deal with a world that is saturated with self-help, that, that is fueled by self-talk, that replaces everything with the, with the pursuit of self-gain? Like, how do you engage a world that says that we have the power to change ourselves? I'll give you a hint. It's not through studying more. <laughs> it's not through, through going to more conferences, whether digital or physical. It's not even through trying to evangelize more. No, it's, it's more subtle than that. And frankly, far more terrifying than that. You know, recently I was... Um, I was reading this book uh, by St. Gregory the Great. He's a, he's a sixth century church father and it's called the Book of Pastoral Rule and, and he wrote it for his disciples where he's teaching them how to disciple people. And I love reading books like this because it reminds me that these questions and these difficulties that we're experiencing in the 21st century, the church has been navigating for hundreds of years. But there was this particular line uh, that St. Gregory says that I, I found to be very eye-opening. He says this. He says, the spiritual director, the one that is discipling or pastoring the people, ought to know that there are many vices that appear as virtues. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's, that's an interesting shift. Many vices that appear as virtues. How is that possible? He then goes on and gives a couple of examples. He talks about how at times people will appear as just incredibly frugal, just holding all their money. And he says, but actually it's hiding the vice of greed when you get just a little bit deeper into their heart. Or he then says, whenever people are spiritually zealous and passionate for the word, he says at times though, at the very core, it is they're, they're hiding the vice of wrath or of anger. Or he even gives a really subtle example. He says, or, or, or people that on the surface, they just look incredibly efficient are actually hiding the vice of this excessive haste that got us into trouble in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, hastily grabbing the fruit in the beginning. Now I know you're thinking like, what in the world is his point? What are you talking about all this for? It's because his point is that sometimes subtle shifts, small shifts, lead to grave consequences. For what can appear on the surface as a virtue is actually rooted in a vice, which is typically connected to a wound that we're trying to self-medicate. And here's the crazy part of this. A lot of the time, we don't even know what's happening because we're just a degree 
or two off. If, if I'm being honest, that's, that's, that's almost like my story of ministry for the last 20 years. You know, I, in 2000, um, I was a student at Ozark Christian College. And man, I remember, I, I, I absolutely loved my time there. It, it was a home, and I was finally studying something that made me feel alive. And in my first semester, I tried to take the wisdom that was around me and just, just kind of ease my way in. So I took a small amount of credits, but, but I developed this ravenous appetite for the word of God. And I was like, I just can't get enough. So every semester I would add a couple more credit hours and a couple more credit hours and a couple more credit hours until one semester I actually had, was at the level of 34 credit hours. And I was going at such a pace that I finished two bachelor's degrees in four years and my last semester I only needed nine hours to complete it. And here's what was crazy. Here's what was interesting. I was applauded for this. I was praised for that. By, by professors, by friends, by, by family members. But one of the things I didn't realize is that, is that, is that sometimes a virtue can actually be a vice in disguise. You see, I didn't realize it, but I had actually started to shift my course by just a couple of degrees. And the further I went into this journey, the more distant I became from the destination I thought I was moving toward. Because whenever I went into my master's, my, my pace didn't stop, it had actually increased. So I was averaging 20 hours of master's credit per semester. I had two kids with a third on the way, working full-time in ministry, also as a teaching assistant, and I had a worship band that we traveled with and recorded music with on the side. And I was applauded for this. Praised for this. By elders. By other pastors. By friends. Which is why it was so confusing <laughs> when I was sitting in the doctor's office because I couldn't get my pinkies to stop tingling. And my, my doctor looked at me and he just said, okay, he goes, just, just, just give me your typical month. And then I started listing all the things off and I got done and he goes, okay, he goes, I, I, I know what the problem is and I know the solution. And I was like, awesome doc, like hit me. Like, let's just fix this thing. I got stuff to do. <laughs> And he goes, well, you're hyperventilating. He said, you're having panic attacks. He says, and the solution is you need to cut out half of everything you just told me that you're doing. I, I don't know what it is in me. It's like I, got, I have like this spiritual DNA of, of Peter, but my natural reaction was to argue with the doctor. I was like, no, 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 I'm not panicked. I'm not having panic attacks. I'm not panicked. Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? No, that's not, of course, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to catch my breath, even though I'm taking really deep breaths. And I mean, but everybody does that, right? I mean, you know, I mean, of course I wake up at, you know, two, three, four in the morning and can't go back to sleep. And that happens almost every single week. But I mean, everybody does that, right? And cut out half of my stuff. What are you, you're asking me to stop doing ministry or training for ministry? No, 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 no. Sorry, I'm not letting those people down. And in his patience, the doctor nodded looked down at his pad of paper and scribbled a thing or two and then ripped off a sheet and handed it to me. And he goes, okay, here's your prescription for antidepressants. I'll see you in nine months. Subtle shifts can have grave consequences. And man, I, I, I wish right now I could say, and that's when the story changed. And I could get off of this stool and start talking about the theological implications of it. But here's the problem. It didn't change it got worse. So then I go on and start my PhD. At this time, we had three kids with the fourth one on the way. I'm working full time. And they say, hey, we're going to give you seven years to get the degree done. I'm like, why wait seven years? So instead, I worked hard to finish it under four. And I was applauded for this. I was celebrated for this. 
at times even promoted for this. But one of the things that was not being recognized is that sometimes what appears to be virtuous is actually a vice. That sometimes we're living life just a degree or two off and the further that we go, the more distant we become from our intended destination. Which is why it was so overwhelming for me. When I was sitting on my couch and I opened up the mail and pulled out the diploma, my wife sat down next to me and said, is that it? And I nodded and she said, what are you feeling? And I I will never forget. I will never forget the way that felt. With tears in my eyes, I said, I'm, I'm thinking, I thought this was gonna feel different. You see, I didn't know it. I didn't know that I was a degree or two off, but somewhere deep down, I had begun to believe that what I was in pursuit of, this ministry training, and at times even ministry itself, was going to heal what was broken inside of me. It was going to restore what was broken in me. And then I find myself on the couch 27 miles east from the destination I thought I was going towards. You know, it's, it's easy to be in a sermon like this. And it's easy at times to, to, to sit on our pedestals and to use these platforms to mock things like self-help. I mean, let, let, let me let me just get it out there. Self help gets it wrong. <laughs> like like, like self help replaces scripture with self talk. Self help replaces holiness with financial gain and happiness. Self help divorces transformation of us from the very spirit that created us. Like self help gets it wrong. And it's really kind of easy to mock it, especially when you can summarize almost all of self-help with their slogan that all of them sound something like, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. But we do this too. It's just that a lot of us call it ministry. But we engage in cheap self-help tactics too. We've just found unique ways to baptize it. I mean, come on, we, we, we fill our schedules with all kinds of serving others and writing sermons with hospital visits and with funeral arrangements. And we go in and we rescue all of the sinners that are in peril and all of the marriages that are messed up. We wake up early and we go to bed late and we are monitoring all of these things like attendance and budgets and live streams. And the one thing we keep forgetting to monitor is the health of ourself. And over time, the unhealth of us doesn't minimize, it multiplies, it grows. To the point where we become a danger, not just to ourselves, but to everyone around us. And we do this in the name of self-denial. And Jesus tried to warn us about this. He knew how easy it was for self-denial to evolve into self-hate. He knew it. And he tried to stop us by embedding self-love into his answer to this question. Matthew chapter 22. As soon as I start reading the text, you're going to recognize it. Matthew 22 verse 36. Jesus gets asked this question from one of the Pharisees. Teacher... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Heard this one? And Jesus' reply was very kosher. (laughs) I mean, he he replies by, by reciting the great Shema, Deuteronomy 6. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. So far, so good. So far, this sounds familiar. We give all of ourself to the Lord. But then he says something really weird in verse 39. The first phrase, very strange. Second phrase gets a little weirder. 
This is what he says, first phrase, verse 39. And the second is like it. Or let me, let me restate it just a little bit. And the second commandment is like the first commandment. Which I remember the, the first time that that hit me, I was like, no, wait a minute, that's weird. <laughs> like, what is like the first? I mean, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I kind of thought that was in a category of its own. <laughs> I kind of thought that there was nothing like that. But according to Jesus, the second commandment is like the first commandment. And then it gets weirder. Love your neighbor as yourself. Did you, did you catch that? It's a subtle shift. L let me restate it. Love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. Here's why that gets pretty wild. Because what Jesus just did is he developed an equation that is essential for evangelism, but that we have completely overlooked. He says, if you do not know how to love yourself, you will not know how to love your neighbor. And if the second is like the first, don't be surprised when you do not know how to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's incredible to me how often we overlook the truth that's embedded in the greatest commandments. And we do it by distorting self-denial. You see, self-denial is not the same as neglecting the self. Self-denial is not the same as ignoring the self or putting down the self. We have this weird definition even of humility. That we, we almost think humility is a divine depression. The more that we can talk down about ourselves, apparently the more holy we are. That's not what Jesus just said. <laughs> he said, if you don't understand how to love yourself, you will not understand how to love your neighbor. And apparently the second's like the first. Now, I, I, I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> some of you are probably like sitting there thinking like, okay, listen, hippie. One of the things that's not so subtle, Shane, is the fact that your topic that, that President Proctor already talked about, that you mentioned, really centers on the Holy Spirit, but you haven't really talked about the Spirit much at all. You haven't talked about the third person of the Trinity in this sermon very much at all. I mean, yeah, you've had a little bit of scripture, a lot of rants, and all these stories that say, quit neglecting yourself, but what about the Spirit, Shane? I get it. And you know what? You're right. Like the church, I haven't really mentioned the spirit much at all. And that's actually, that's actually kind of my point. It's really hard for the Holy Spirit to dwell in you, to make its home in you when you keep insisting on burning down the house. It's incredible to me how, how, how phenomenal we've gotten at overlooking the importance of self-care. Instead, we shroud our unhealth in all kinds of versions of ministry. But in reality, we are undercutting the very mission that we are in pursuit of. And it's all through small shifts. But small shifts have grave consequences because if you're off just a degree or two, don't be surprised that the further you get into the journey, you are nowhere near the destination that you started to go towards in the beginning. Small shifts. Let me, let me, just, let me just bring up an issue that seems to be something we are both good at and that has occurred a subtle shift over the last 20 to 30 years. Evangelism. It's interesting. Because right now, my goodness, it's not the word evangelism I hear a lot. Evangelism has a new code word, multiply. I hear the word multiply all the time right now. Whether I'm looking at blogs or I'm at a leadership conference or I'm at you know, some sort of convention or if I'm talking to small church ministers or, or large church ministers, multiply, multiply, multiply. And I just can't help avoiding this nagging question. Do we know what we're multiplying? or let me, let, me, let me say it a little different, that it gets a little more personal. Are we worthy of being multiplied? 
Like, are we worthy of being multiplied? It's like we repeat multiplication so much that we actually think that to fulfill the gospel, it only takes to be zealous for evangelism. But Jesus actually disagrees with that. (laughs) Zeal for evangelism is not what you were called to. It's deeper than that. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 23, so you're talking 20 verses or so after the greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Jesus is getting a little rowdy with the Pharisees, but listen to what he says. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, zealous for their evangelism. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded in converting them, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Apparently, zeal for evangelism at times isn't always that helpful for the kingdom. Especially if you're ignoring this question. Are you worthy of being multiplied? Or every time we're multiplying, are we just multiplying cancer? That's actually the definition of cancer, by the way. Multiplying too much. I think it's important for us to to just stop for a minute and ask this prior question to our zeal for evangelism. Are we worthy of being multiplied? Because if if we're just multiplying cancer, I would rather us go through chemo And let's be honest, church, let's be honest. 2020 was hardly a banner year for the church. I mean, 2020 was hardly a banner year for us, for Bible-believing Christians, for followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, what in the world happened in 2020? I mean, yes, (laughs) even after the pandemic, even after the racial unrest, even after the the, the election that can only really be called the charade. It is still true that the word of God is moving. It is still true that the Holy Spirit is working to transform and to empower us. It is still true. But what is also true is that 2020 revealed we have a lot of stinking work to do in our communities, in our churches, and in ourselves. It's incredible to me whenever I think of, from as a historian's perspective, what we just went through in 2020. It's easy to get caught up in the suffering, but from my mind, what we just went through was one of the greatest opportunities for a revival that we have seen in decades. What do I mean? Well, (laughs) in the second and third century, You're talking 1,800 years ago. The church experienced a revival right after two massive epidemics. An epidemic in the second century, an epidemic in the third century that wiped out by conservative estimates 25% of the inhabited world, which would be the equivalent of around 80 million deaths just in America alone. And yet around 50 years after the peak of that second pandemic, the emperor converted and the Roman empire was swallowed up by the kingdom of Jesus Christ. How? How is that possible? Well, because during the pandemics, Christians didn't spend their time fighting for their rights. During the pandemics, Christians didn't spend their time accusing people of perpetuating some sort of mysterious evil. Christians didn't even spend their time strategizing how to make sure that they weren't getting sick. No, they went where the sick was sick and they actually helped those people sometimes survive, but oftentimes transferring their infirmities onto themselves and dying in their place. During the pandemic, the Christians functioned like the church like the body of Christ that is willing to sacrifice themselves, not out of self-hate, but out of love for their neighbor, which is generated from love for themselves, which is ultimately culminated in the fact that God died for us and he says, I love you. And what did we do? In 2020, what did we do? You know, I used to think Esau was an idiot. 
you know, you Esau, like Jacob and Esau. Like Esau, like I'm just like, what? He is a fool. But you know the story from Genesis 25 where, where Esau has been, you know, he's been hunting all day long and he comes in in dramatic fashion. He's like, I'm so famished. And Jacob's like, well, what do you know? I'm making a soup. I have a stew. And Esau's like, please give me some. And Jacob's a little cunning. He's like, all right, fine. I'll give you some soup. Sell me your birthright. And Esau did it. He sold his birthright, the blessing, something with infinitely greater value. He sold it for a bowl of soup. I pray that I'm wrong. But sometimes I, since, since 2021's began, I, I've begun to wonder, did we sell a revival for a bowl of soup in 2020? Like, I mean, in 2020, did we exchange a revival for something with infinitely less value? Because a lot of the times whenever I'm looking around at us, when I'm looking in the mirror, a lot of us, we, we, we exchanged our witness for political platforms. We exchanged our message for social media rants. We exchanged life in the spirit for political parties. And I just want to say, our mission is bigger than this. <laughs> what has happened? How did we get here? Small shifts have grave consequences. And over the last several decades, we have distorted self-denial as self-hate. And we have actually neglected the love and the care for ourselves that Christ himself did for himself even when he was in flesh on this earth. We've neglected to even ask simple questions like, are we worthy of being multiplied? And by avoiding these questions, we've, we've actually gotten to a place where just a couple of degrees off, we find ourselves 27 miles east of a destination that we thought we were headed toward. This is not what the Spirit empowered us to do. We were called to make disciples, not win elections. We were called to look more like Jesus, not to sound more like political pundits. We were called to live life in the spirit, to be transformed by the spirit through God's grace. And because of the cross of Jesus Christ, you see, 2020 didn't reveal what is broken in the world. It revealed what's broken in us. But here's, here's the good news. Even in our failure, it's still true. It's still true that the Spirit longs to transform this broken world through the church, through us. It is still true that the Spirit longs for us to engage the love of the Trinity that they have experienced for all of eternity, a love that doesn't need to put down ourselves so that we can exalt others and doesn't need to put down others to exalt ourselves, but a love that is so understanding of our value and our worth because of Christ's redemption that we are willing to ask ourselves tough questions so that through the love and the way that we take care of ourselves in partnership with the Spirit, we are then more equipped to love our neighbors. And if the second one is like the first, that we are actually more able to offer all of ourself to the Lord, who smiles and doesn't then look at us in ridicule, but he says, with you, I'm so well pleased. Here's my challenge. Church, in 2021, I'm not asking you to fast from social media. I'm not asking you to, to change any of your views. This is what I'm asking you to do. Be self-reflective. Fast from news for one year 
and replace all of that time and all those voices with the voice of the Spirit, which is calling you deeper into him, so that by 2022, we will be ready to love our neighbors the way that we love ourselves. And to that, in the name of the Lord, hopefully we will be able to say with those in the revival, amen. Let it be so.